Amen. You can be seated. Open up your Bibles to Genesis 49. Genesis 49. We're continuing our examination of what we've called the judgment seat of Jacob. Jacob is 147 years old. He knows that he's about to pass into eternity, and so he calls his sons before him one last time before he dies. And he's going to kind of review their behavior, as it, as it were. His sons are adults, remember, they're not, they're not teenagers, they're not in their 20s, they're parents and grandparents in their own right. And they're each going to pass before Jacob, and they're going to hear his evaluation of them. We've dealt with, in, verse, in chapter 48, we dealt with the grandsons of Jacob. Remember, Joseph's two sons, they were Ephraim and Manasseh. What did, what did he do? What did, what did Jacob do to his two grandsons, Ephraim and Manasseh? Do you remember? He adopted them. He said, you're mine. He told Joseph, your sons, they're mine. They're my sons. And he adopted them. And by doing so, he gave Joseph who was the favored son, gave him a double portion in the land of Canaan. So that's, that's kind of what happened there. Then we looked at Reuben. Reuben, the firstborn, was Reuben in, in, a, in a general sense? Would you say Reuben was a good guy or not so much? Kind of left you with a bad taste in your mouth. I, I hope if you, if you read, you see uh, Reuben was in verses 3 and 4. What was his problem? Well, he had unbridled passion. He was not a man in control of himself. He committed adultery with his father's wife, Bilhah, and as a result of that, he lost his birthright. And then last week, we looked at Levi and Simeon. Levi and Simeon, they are dealt with in verses 5 down through verse 7. Levi and Simeon were called cruel. Why were they called cruel? Well, because there was that whole incident with Dinah and Shechem where Levi and Simeon massacred an entire town in revenge for what had happened to their sister. What happened to their sister Dinah wasn't right, but they shouldn't have done what they did. Murder is not acceptable as an act of vengeance, uh, and, and we saw that last week. As a result, Levi and Simeon were dispersed. Throughout the, the, throughout the people. When it came time to inherit the land, the tribe of Simeon got a few cities in the middle of Judah, in the middle of the tribal territory of Judah, and the Levites, the descendants of Levi, were scattered all throughout in 48 different Levitical cities. You remember? And so they didn't get, there is no tribe of Levi. There is the cities that belong to the Levites. And we come now to Judah. Judah, verse 8, is where we're going to start this morning. Judah. Now, Judah is, we're going we're gonna to deal first with Judah's future. So, remember, as the boys come before their father, they are told about kind of a review of their life and then what's going to happen to them. So, we'll deal with his future first. Real quick, Judah, on our, on our family chart here. Judah is the fourth son of Jacob by Leah, his first wife. Okay, we will, they are not all in order as we go, but at least at this point, we've got Leah was the mother of Judah. So his fourth son, thus far, we have gone in order, but we will break that here in just a little bit. Look at verse 8. <clears throat> he says, Jacob says to Judah, Judah. Thou art he whom thy brethren shall praise. Thy hand shall be in the neck of thine enemies. Thy father's children shall bow down before thee. Now, Jacob's sons bowing before someone else. Does that ring any bells to you? Maybe? Joseph. Remember, Joseph had a dream Back in, uh, back in Genesis 37, where he told his brothers, I had a dream that all of you bowed down to me. And then he had another one where his brothers and his parents bowed down to him. 
they, they didn't take it very well. You remember that? They, that was part of what led them to, to throw him into the pit and sell him. But Jacob declares that one day all of his descendants will give tribute to the descendants of Judah. One day, Judah, all of your brethren are going to bow before you. You're going to rise to prominence. You're going to have a very, a very preeminent place amongst your brethren. Verse 9, Judah is a lion's whelp. What would you say is a lion's whelp? Little baby. Little baby. So a young lion, right? Judah is a lion's whelp from the prey. My son, thou art gone up. He stooped down. He couched as a lion. And as an old lion, who shall rouse him up? Kind of weird speech. We don't, we don't talk like this anymore. He refers to his son, Judah, as a young lion and then as an old lion in the same sentence. What, what's he talking about? Well, a lion's whelp he speaks of in re regards to prey. In this particular area, lions kind of the top of the food chain. They, they take what they want. That's exactly what he's saying. He says, from the prey, my son, thou art gone up. What, what, does, what does a lion eat for lunch? Well, w whatever it wants, right? And so that's, that's essentially what he's saying here. You get what you want, and then an old lion, the idea of one who can rest without fear of rival. One commentator said it this way. Jacob describes Judah as, as strong as a young lion and as entrenched as an old lion. I, I think that's probably a fairly, a fairly safe way of saying it. Verse 10. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh come. And unto him shall the gathering of the people be. What is a scepter the, the, the icon or the emblem of royalty, the kingship, right? So he says the scepter, the king, the, the royal blood won't depart from Judah nor a lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh come. Now, the first king of Israel, we've talked about him at, at length on Sunday evenings. The first king of Israel, his name was Saul. Saul was of the tribe of Benjamin. He was a Benjamite, but it's interesting. Israel's first king, the one that Israel chose, the one that Israel said, we want to be like the other nations. When Israel got the king that they desired, it was from Benjamin, and Saul didn't, didn't pan out that great. But the second king of Israel, a man after God's own heart, was David, who was of the tribe of Judah, which we're looking at now. Now, Jacob declares that Judah will be the tribe of royalty until Shiloh come. Now, Shiloh is a word that is of uncertain meaning in the Hebrew. If you look this up in a, in a lexicon, you'll find that it says uh, uncertain origin, uncertain meaning. But as best we can tell, and in its context, the word Shiloh means something to the effect it always has to do with peace so you see tranquil or peace or sometimes it's been associated with prince of peace whatever its meaning the name shiloh is associated with messiah shiloh is it, it has to do with with the messiah with the christ who will come jesus christ being obviously the fulfillment of that prophecy the king of the Jews will be of the line of Judah through David until the arrival of Messiah. And Messiah, when Messiah comes and it's yet future, he will establish his kingdom. We read in Isaiah chapter 9 verse 6, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders, and his name shall be called Wonderful. Counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Again, with, the, with that Shiloh uh, tint there, okay, of peace. That's what this is. Of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth even forever. This kingdom... The kingdom, this is still future, by the way. 
Okay? But as we've talked about on Sunday mornings in our, in our study of Luke, the disciples didn't understand why did, why did Jesus come and why didn't he establish his earthly kingdom then? They didn't get it. Well, because Jesus came the first time as the redeemer of men, he will come again to establish his earthly kingdom where he will rule, where he will reign. And what will overcome Jesus? Nothing. Nothing. What will try to overcome Jesus? Who will try to overcome Jesus? Might be a good way of asking. The Antichrist, well, the, the Antichrist will try during the, during the tribulation. And then during the millennial kingdom, at the end of the millennial kingdom, Satan will put out one last try. And how does that go for him? Do you remember? It doesn't go well, right? He amasses the force, uh, the force of humanity from the four corners of the earth. And they gather together. And God says a word. And it's over. Everything about it is over. That's the Messiah of the line of Judah. So even now here in Egypt, all of these thousands of years prior to that, Jacob is speaking and alluding to, by faith, what will one day be the, be the lot of his son Judah. In the book of Revelation, John is weeping because no one could open the seven-sealed book. Do you remember this? says, I wept much because no one was found to open the book. Those seven seals are the seven seals that start the tribulation off. And, and we read in Revelation 5, 5, And one of the elders said unto me, Weep not, behold the lion of the tribe of Judah. Right. The lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, had prevailed to open the book, to loose the seven seals thereof. Interesting that Jacob's commendation to his son Judah, he talked about lions a lot. And here we have one of the names of Jesus Christ, the lion of the tribe of Judah, ends up playing out. And where, where does Revelation 5, 5 happen? Where, where does this happen? In heaven. Before the throne of God, this is the name of Jesus Christ. The descendants of Judah will hold the throne of Israel. Until the arrival of Messiah, who will be of the tribe of Judah and who will establish an everlasting kingdom. And of his kingdom, there will be no end. Yes, ma'am. Is there any correlation with how that is spelled with Judah? It's just a New Testament spelling of an, of an Old Testament word. Sometimes they, if, if you notice, sometimes in the, in the New Testament, as you're reading, sometimes a word like the name Noah in the New Testament, it's sometimes spelled N-O-E, and, and we would pronounce it Noe. It's referring to Noah, or Elijah is, is spelled as Elias. It's a New Testament spelling of an Old Testament, of an Old Testament word. Look at verse 11. <clears throat> We're still looking at Judah's future. Binding his foal unto the vine, and his ass's colt unto the choice vine, he washed his garments in wine, and his clothes in the blood of grapes, his eyes shall be red with wine, and his teeth white with milk. Now, here he's speaking a, a little bit. Uh, he, he's using some word pictures here, and he's using some, some linguistic devices. He's, he's making a point here. These verses, verse 11 and 12, are speaking of the wealth and abundance that Judah will have. Remember. Being of the line of kings, kings typically have more, more, of the, more of the things money can buy. In speaking of binding livestock to a vine, he says that he's going to bind his foal unto the vine and his ass's colt unto the choice vine. How good would your harvest have to be for you to allow your livestock out into your crop field and say, it, it's fine? You'd have to have a pretty good yield, wouldn't you? That's the idea. Look, look, Judah's going to have so much abundance, he's going to tie his donkey to, the, to, his, best, to his best grapevine, and it'll still be fine. He'll still have an abundance. He will wash his garments in wine. That sounds like an expensive venture, doesn't it? Yeah, exactly. Why, why can he do this? Well, because he has such an abundance. So... In, in this passage, speaking of washing his garments in wine and his teeth uh, will be white with milk and, and such, 
He's talking about an overabundance. So Judah, Judah is going to rise in prominence among his brothers. He's going to be the tribe from which the kings will come. And eventually the tribe from which the king will come. And he's going to have an abundance of all things. He's going to have whatever he needs to the point that he could be wasteful if he chose to be. In reading Jacob's prophetic blessing on Judah, what do you think of Judah so far? Now, we, I asked you, what do you think of Reuben? Reuben, kind of, kind of a, a washout. Levi and Simeon, don't, don't feel too good about it. How do you feel about Judah so far? You feel like he, he's, he's really something. He has attained to quite, quite, uh, quite the degree of blessing. And in reading Jacob's prophetic blessing on Judah, we want to look back at Judah's life, and we want to see what kind of a man deserves such blessing. What did Judah do to, to make it just that he receive all of this that was coming to him, all of this tremendous blessing? What did Judah do? So let's take a moment, and let's back up, and let's look at Judah's past. What did Judah do? In real, Reuben, he, he, he committed adultery with his stepmother and lost his birthright. Levi and Simeon murdered an entire village, and they lost, uh, they lost their inheritance as a territory. What did Judah do to get so much good said about him? Well, let's look. I'm going to have you turn to Genesis 38, if you would, and we'll get there in just a moment. Genesis 38. <coughs> While you're turning there, let me tell you the story. Again, I, I know that you're familiar with these stories, so I'm not going back and telling you all of the story of Joseph, because I know you're familiar with the story of Joseph. But in Genesis 37, the sons of Jacob had thrown Joseph into the pit. You remember? Uh, he had come to see them, and, uh, and he was wearing his coat of many colors, okay? His, his emblem of his favored status. And he shows up, and his brothers are put out with him. They throw him in the pit, and they're discussing, what should we do with him? Because some of the brothers said, well, let's just kill him and be done with it. Other brothers had the idea, well, we can just leave him in this pit. He'll die of natural causes. And then we can say, we don't know what happened to him. Reuben, we know, he had the idea that he would come back and deliver Joseph. But in Genesis 37, you're in 38. If you want to, you can look back at verse 26. It says, and Judah, here's our, here's our, here's our man, Judah said unto his brethren, What profit is it if we slay our brother and conceal his blood? Come and let us sell him to the Ishmaelites. Let not our hands be upon him, for he's our brother and our flesh, and his brethren were content. What do you think of Judah? It's a good idea, right? He sees the investment opportunity here, right? Let's, we don't need to kill him. Let's, let's sell him. And when you read verse 26, you think, well, that's, that's good thinking. And then you get to verse 27 and you think, oh, goodness. You're, you're going to sell your, your own flesh and blood into slavery? But that's his first, his first major, uh, major point that we find of Judah in, in Genesis, in his story. What do you think? Should we give him a, a plus or a minus for his first appearance? Selling his brother, would you say that's a good thing or a kind of a black mark? It's a small, it's a, a small we know what happened, but just on its, on its surface, what do you think of Judah? Willing to sell his brother? Not very good. Saved his life, but only to by selling by selling someone into slavery in this day, you're you're condemning them to a slow death, essentially. So his his con, his his concern was not let's let's save him. It was let's make a buck, and he did. They made their their pieces of silver. So we're going to give him a black mark here for his his first appearance. Okay, Genesis thirty eight. Okay, this is. I need you to, to hold with me here because Genesis 38 is one of those passages uh, that probably we're not as familiar with. The story of Joseph starts in Genesis 37 and then goes all the way to the end of Genesis. Genesis 38 is many times overlooked because we're looking and we're concerned with the story of Joseph. Okay, 
Let's, let's dive into Genesis 38 because it's all about Judah. This whole chapter has to do with Judah. At the end of Genesis 37, they sell Joseph into slavery and they depart. Verse 38, or chapter 38, verse 1. And it came to pass at that time that Judah went down from his brethren and turned in to a certain Adulamite whose name was Hira. And Adulamite was a Canaanite. So this is a friend of the land. So a Canaanite man uh, and Judah, they're, they're friends. They have formed a, formed a friendship. You, you can think on the outset, that doesn't sound good. You'd probably be right because the Canaanites were wicked people. But in this case, Judah and this Canaanite friend Hira get together. He was an Adulamite. Where have you heard the word Adullam before? It relates to a cave. If you... If, what is it? David. David stayed in the cave of Adullam. Okay? Much, much later. Thousands of years later. But Judah takes as a wife a woman named Shua. And she bears him three sons. We read here in chapter 38. His sons' names are Ur. I, I think that's a great name. That's the father standing in the delivery room, and they say, what's his name? Er, er, and they wrote it down, right? That's, I think that's just what happened. So we've got Ur, er, Onan, and Shelah. So we have three sons of Judah by a Canaanite woman, Ur, er, Onan, Shelah. Now, obviously, as we read over these, these verses, the events of Genesis 38 took place over many years. We're talking about decades within this chapter. So don't, don't allow that to be lost. Look at verse 6. And Judah took a wife for Ur, his firstborn, whose name was Tamar. And Ur, Judah's firstborn, was wicked in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord slew him. We don't have any information beyond that. We don't know what he did. We don't know how particularly God slew him. But Ur, the firstborn, he's out. He's out of the picture at this point. Now, in this time and in this culture, when a, woman, when a woman's husband died, a principle came into effect, which was the principle of the Leverite marriage, or the Leverite marriage. Okay? Leverite marriages is when a brother or next of kin of the dead man would take the wife of his deceased brother as his own in order to raise up children to the name of his brother. Okay? This happened all the time. This happened a lot. You're very, very familiar with at least one instance of this in the book of Ruth. Ruth is, Ruth's marriage to Boaz was a Leverite marriage. Boaz was the next of kin to Ruth's husband. And so he married her in order to raise up children to the name of her deceased husband. So if you remember in Matthew chapter 22, verses 23 to 32, the Sadducees came and they asked Jesus a question. Do you remember this? They came and they said, so there was a guy who had a wife and he died not having children and he had six brothers. Do you remember this story? And they said, well, the first one took and he died without children. And the second one took without children, and so on. And all three of the, all seven of the brothers had this woman as their wife. None of them had children. And they asked the question of Jesus, whose wife is she in the resurrection? Okay. Our point is not to get off in the weeds on that. Jesus said, she's in, in the resurrection, we're not married nor given in marriage. So Jesus made the point. But that was speaking of a Leverite marriage of when the when the husband dies and doesn't have children, then the brother steps in in order to raise up children. Children being a very, very big deal in this culture. So Judah did exactly what culture demanded. He gave Tamar to Onan, who was also killed by God in verses 9 and 10. So by right, remember, Judah has three sons. He has Ur, Onan, and Shelah. By right, who should Tamar have gone to? The third, right? Because Ur is dead, Onan is dead, 
and now we're looking for Shayla. Right? Are you following with me here? Okay. Now, Judah has a problem because Shayla was too young. He was just a boy. And so, look at verse 11. Then said Judah to Tamar, his daughter-in-law, Remain a widow at thy father's house till Shelah my son be grown. Talk about a weird culture, right? Wait in the house of your father as a widow till my, till my child is old enough to be your husband. Till Shelah my son be grown, for he said, Lest peradventure he die also as his brethren did. And Tamar went and dwelt in her father's house. So Judah's concerned. He's losing sons. He has three, and he's down to one. <clears throat> so Judah makes this, this I, he gives this idea to Tamar. Look, you go, dwell as a widow in the house of your father, and then when Shelah is old enough, I'll give him to you. As, as your husband, and he can, can perform the duties of a Leverite marriage. Now, as Tamar is living as a widow in her father's house, waiting for Shelah to grow up, Judah's wife dies. Look at verse 12, and you'll see Judah's wife dies, and after some time had passed, Judah goes on about his business. He goes up to Timnath to shear his sheep. And here's where it, here's where it gets very, very dicey. Look at verse 13. And it was told Tamar, where is Tamar? She's living at her dad's house. As a widow, she's waiting for Shelah, the third, right? Verse 13. And it was told Tamar, saying, Behold, thy father-in-law goeth up to Timnath to shear his sheep. And she put her widow's garments off from her and covered her with a veil, and wrapped herself and sat in an open place, which is, by the way, to Timnath, for she saw that Shelah was grown, and she was not given unto him for wife. And when Judah saw her, he thought her to be a harlot, because she had covered her face. So Tamar, living at home with her dad, realizes, hey, Shelah's old enough now, but he ha Judah hasn't followed through. Judah hasn't done what he was supposed to do. So she takes matters into her own hands. She, she arrays herself as a harlot, and she goes out. To make a very long and sordid story as succinct as possible, Judah, as he's going up to Timnath to shear his sheep, sees this woman, this prostitute, off to the side, and he decides to employ her services. Judah commits fornication with Tamar, his daughter-in-law. Never, never discovering who she is. He doesn't know who she is because of the veil that she was wearing. As payment for her services as a prostitute, Tamar accepted Judah's signet ring and his staff as collateral that he would send payment. So Judah agrees with Tamar, who he doesn't know is Tamar. She's, he thinks she's just a common prostitute. He agrees with her for a price. The price is... I'll send you a lamb. I'll send you a kid from my flock. But he doesn't, he doesn't carry that with him, so he gives her collateral. He gives his signet ring. He gives his staff, and he also gives some bracelets that were very, very iconic to him. So he gives those to her with the understanding, I'll send payment, and I'll get my stuff back. Okay, That's what's going on. So Judah goes... And he sends the lamp by the hand of some servants. And the servants go looking for, for this prostitute on the road to Timnath. And guess what? They couldn't find her. She was gone. So they return to Jacob or to, to Judah and they say, We don't know where she is. She's missing. So he takes his 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 lamb back and just goes on without his signet ring, without his staff, and without the bracelets that he had mentioned. Look at verse 24. And it came to pass about three months after that it was told Judah, saying, Tamar, thy daughter-in-law, hath played the harlot. And also, behold, she is with child by whoredom. And Judah said, Bring her forth and let her be burnt. Oh, what a tangled web we weave, huh? Judah, in a, in a moment of, of, of self-righteousness perhaps, 
Well, if she's, if if she's, if she has has allowed this to happen, if she has played the harlot, then she should die the death of a harlot. You remember Simeon and Levi asking their father about Dinah. They said, "Should we should we deal with our sister after a har as as a harlot?" Okay. Here's how they dealt with harlots: let her be burnt. And so they haul Timnat, or they they haul Tamar in to Judah. Now. What does Tamar have in her possession? She has a signet ring, a staff, and bracelets that belong to Judah, who happens to be the father of the child that she bears by whoredom. So Tamar comes in, verse 25, when she was brought forth, she sent to her father-in-law, saying, By the man whose these are, am I with child? So she produces Judah's stuff. And she said, Discern, I pray thee, who, whose are these, the signet, the bracelets, and the staff? And Judah, to his credit, in verse, 20, uh, in verse 26, And Judah acknowledged them and said, She hath been more righteous than I, because that I gave her not to Shelah my son, and he knew her again no more. Well, that's kind of a strange story, isn't it? Judah now has children by his daughter-in-law. So, children slash grandchildren, essentially, is what Judah now has by his daughter-in-law. Tamar will go on to bear twins from her relationship with Judah. Now, in verse 26, when he says, she has been more righteous than I because I didn't give her Shelah, he's just acknowledging the fact, he's not saying that what he did was right. He's just saying, I should have kept the agreement. I should have maintained the Leverite marriage. She should have been given to my third son, Shalem, but she wasn't. And so now I bear the brunt. Tamar goes on to bear twins from her relationship with Judah. Their names are Perez and Zerah. Perez and Zerah. That is of pivotal importance to what we're looking at. Perez and Zerah. The two sons of Tamar by Judah. Now, we're, we're giving Judah check marks or black marks here. What do you think of Genesis 38? Good, good story for Judah. Is this a is this something? Is this an asset on his resume or a liability? A liability. We're going to give him another black mark. He's not he's not doing too well. Remember all that we read in Genesis 49. All the good things that were going to come to, to Judah? He, he certainly hasn't earned it yet, has he? Look at, flip, flip forward, if you would, to Genesis 43. Again, I'm not going to give you the whole story for sake of time, but <clears throat> in Genesis 43 and 44, the sons of Jacob are appearing before the prime minister of Egypt in the famine. Who's the prime minister of Egypt? Joseph. Now, you know that, but do they know that? No, they don't know that. Jacob, back in Canaan, is hesitant to allow Benjamin, his other child by Rachel, to go down to Egypt for fear that he'll lose him just as he lost Joseph. So, Joseph was the favored son, and now Benjamin is the favored son who replaces him because they were, by the, they, they were sons by the favored wife. Okay? Again. Proof positive that polygamy is not the answer, okay? And neither is child favoritism, okay? Joseph was the favorite till he disappeared. Benjamin rises in prominence. And Jacob's a little bit leery of sending Benjamin off into a situation that he doesn't know about. But they have to take Benjamin because Joseph, the prime minister of Egypt, had said, you can't come back for food unless you bring your youngest brother. So they have to bring him, and to calm his father, guess who speaks up? To calm his father about sending Benjamin down into a very dangerous situation, guess who speaks up? Judah. Look at verse 8 of Genesis 43. And Judah said unto Israel, or Jacob his father, send the lad with me. We will rise and go that we may live and not die, both we and thou and also our little ones. <coughs> I will be surety for him. Of my hand shalt thou require him. If I bring him not unto thee and set him before thee, then let me bear the blame forever. 
that's commendable, isn't it? He steps up. He says, look, Dad, I get that you're nervous about sending Benjamin. I take complete responsibility for Benjamin's safety. If I lose him, I will be to blame. The, 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 the blame won't be spread out. It's on me. Dad, put Benjamin in my care. Allow me to be the one who cares for him. So they arrive down in Egypt, and Joseph tests his brothers. Do you remember this story? He gives, he, he gives their money back to them, and then he puts his silver cup in the, in the bag of Benjamin. And Benjamin is caught, and it looks like Benjamin has stolen from Joseph. Or again, Joseph is setting this up as a, as a test. And so the brothers come in before Joseph, and they're crying. And they're saying, how could this have happened? We don't know what happened. They fall to their knees before Joseph, and Judah speaks up. The, the penalty for stealing Joseph's cup was that the offending party would be his servant. Well, the, offend, the offending party, and I put that in quotes because Joseph put the cup there, but the offending party was Benjamin. And so Judah, true to his word that he gave his father in Canaan, he steps up and he says, Dad, or he says, Joseph, he doesn't know it's Joseph. Verse four, chapter 44, verse 33, Now therefore I pray thee, let thy servant abide instead of the lad of bondman to my Lord, and let the lad go up with his brethren. The punishment for theft of the silver cup was slavery. And Judah has given his word to his father, I'll take responsibility, and he steps up. He says, Master, the prime minister, take me, I'll be your slave, send the boy home. Send Benjamin home to his, to his father, because my father can't bear the loss of another son. So what do you think? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give him a check mark. I'm going to give him a thumbs up here for this. He's got two black marks, and they're really, really bad. And he's got one thing where we say, okay, that, that was a good thing that he did. That was, that was pretty solid. All we know of Jacob doesn't help us to understand the blessings pronounced on him at the judgment seat of Jacob, does it? Given what we know of Jacob from Genesis... Why all of the blessings? Why would God pour out these blessings on him through Jacob? Why would God allow this to happen? Well, there are a lot of lessons that we can learn from the story of Judah. And one day we'll come back and we'll gather all of them. We'll look at more. But here's the lesson or the blessing to leave with today. Here it is, okay? Matthew chapter 1, verse 1. I'll put it up here. It says, The book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham begat Isaac, right? Isaac begat Jacob. Jacob begat Judas, or Judah, again, a New Testament spelling, and his brethren. Verse 3, And Judah, or Judas, begat Perez. And Zerah of Tamar. Perez, we got Ezra, and you go on to verse 16, and at the end of this long line of begats, you have Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is called Christ. If you go to Luke chapter 3, you'll find that the genealogy of Mary also comes through Judah and Perez the son of Tamar, his daughter-in-law, that he, he fathered thinking she was a prostitute along the roadside to Timnah. From this ridiculous mess that we read about in Genesis 38, God chose to use the line of Judah through Tamar, his daughter-in-law, <coughs> to bring his only begotten son who would bring about the redemption of mankind. Here's the lesson. The lesson that we can get, and again, there are lots, but here's the one we're going to grab. If you think your family, your life, or your situation is messed up so bad that God can't use you, how about Genesis 38? Here's a man who had, who had twins by his daughter-in-law thinking she was a prostitute, 
And God chose to use one of those sons, Perez, to be in the line of the Jesus that we know and love and sing about. Our Savior came about through the line of Judah by Tamar. So what's the, what's the blessing from Judah? God can use you. You say, well, you don't know what I've done. Genesis 38. You, you say, you don't know how messed up my family is. Again, Genesis 38. Okay? He had a, a bad, bad mess. But God used him. And God can use us as well. Psalm 103, verse 10 says, He hath not dealt with us after our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. Aren't you glad? What would you get if God rewarded you according to your iniquities? Yeah. Death and hell. Instantly. But he doesn't. He doesn't reward us according to our iniquities. For as the heaven is high above the earth, so great is his mercy toward them that fear him. And a verse that we have that they didn't. Romans 8, 28. And we know that all things work together for good. To them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. So when you lose hope and you feel like this situation is so messed up, I don't even think God could get it straightened out. Don't be discouraged. God can work all things together. God brought his son through the mess of Genesis 38. Judah, who we have a lot of lot more bad things to say about than good. God used this man and used his family. You think about some of the great heroes of the Old Testament. Trace their line back to Judah. David, Solomon came through this man. Take heart. God can use you despite, perhaps, a less than desirable situation. Any thoughts or questions before we close in prayer? I got a, I got a friend that uh, does jail stuff up in Cedar Rapids. And uh, that kind of, I've heard this come out of his mouth all several times. He says, God will work with that. You know? Yep, God will work with that. Yep. If you trace back through the line of Christ in Matthew 1 or in Luke 3, you could go through and you could, some of the people in there we don't know anything about, but a good number of them we do. And a good number of them were far less than desirable people. God can use and God can bring about great things through yielded people. So, take heart. God can use you. Let's bow for a word of prayer. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for your word. Lord, we thank you for the encouragement that we can find within it. Lord, the fact that you could use someone who had so violently messed up their life as Judah, Lord, gives us heart. Lord, because each and every one of us has had perhaps times where we felt that we were beyond being able to be used by you. But Lord, we know that you're faithful and just to forgive our sins if we'll just confess. So, Lord, I pray that, that we would live close to you and that we would allow you to use us in spite of our past. And we'll give you all the praise and the glory for what you accomplish in us. In Jesus' name, amen. You're dismissed.